Good afternoon, everyone. NTTV's Victoria Lada here. And even in a pandemic, our community at UNT still deserves information. Now we take you over to UNT's President Neil Samatrisk for a very special virtual town hall. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Bershai, Vice President of University Brand Strategy and Communications, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Presidential Town Hall with UNT President Neil Smotrisk, Provost Dr. Jennifer Cowley, and Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Elizabeth Wythe. I'll be serving as the moderator today, but for most of the time, I'll be off camera just asking the President questions. Just a few things for you to know. First of all, we appreciate you submitting questions in advance, and some of those will definitely be used, but we're also taking live questions now. So the president wants to hear from you live during this event, and he will be sharing a few topics that you can weigh in on here momentarily. So please do participate by submitting those. Uh, also, uh, not every question will be asked. We apologize, but probably we'll have time limitations on that. So uh, we're gonna do our best to cover most of the important topics today. So uh, please be patient as we move through. And uh, again, the president will take most of the lead, but Provost Cowley and Vice President Wythe will have various remarks at the beginning and throughout the event to answer your questions. So now let's go to UNT President Neil Smotrisk for some opening comments. Mr. President. Well, hello everybody. And uh, Abraham, I'd like the next slide, please. <clears throat> First, I wanna say, I hope all of you are being safe that your families uh, and your loved ones are in good care and good health, and that you're making it through this crisis uh, in a wonderful way, in a way that still allows you to continue to move forward, uh, to make progress in all of our things that we do in our mission, and that allows all of us as a community to remain strong so that we can help our students to thrive. I also wanna say, Without all of you working so hard, <clears throat> we could not have done what we're doing now. Imagine what we've done in such a short period of time, going fully remote and online, helping our students through providing virtual services in many different situations and circumstances, providing funding for them. In fact, I'm very proud of the achievements that you've made, and I think you're doing a phenomenal job, and I can't thank you enough, and I know the entire leadership team here wants to express their deep and sincere gratitude for everything that you've done. I wanna run through a couple things quickly here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Provost Cowley and then subsequently Elizabeth Wythe from Student Affairs. Uh, <clears throat> let's first talk about enrollment. While we were really worried about what might happen during a pandemic, our summer enrollment is up somewhere around six to 7%, could go higher for all we know. That's good, solid progress. It suggests that students who are sheltered in place want to take the opportunity to continue their college careers through online. Perhaps we're just getting used to online and remote delivery, but that's good news for this institution and will help us with our fiscal health. Fall enrollment is not where it should be yet. We're a little bit negative, down around two to 3%, but we think we could flatten out and be neutral, at least for continuing students. Our biggest concern and one that I will talk about more when I talk about budget preparations, is that we're very worried about international students being able to come here, especially in a year where we had a great uh, number of applicants, the biggest number of applicants and acceptances we've ever had, particularly at the master's level. So we hope that they'll be able to get their visas. We hope they'll be able to join us. But I also want you to know that Provost Kali and her team have worked hard to try to create online options to serve our students in fall with the hopes that they'll be able to come and join us in the spring. Along with enrollment, there's a few things that I think have great mitigating uh, impacts on this university. First, CARE 1 and CARE 2 funding has come in. We have received $29 million, 14.5 million will go directly to students for emergency grants and aid. We've already started distributing this. We've had, and I'm gonna let Elizabeth correct me later, not right now, eight or 9,000 applicants, uh, a number of applicants, uh, and we are getting the money out to those based off need and their FAFSA eligibility as soon as we can. This is eligible for students who are enrolled, 
while we have a number of students who've applied for it in the spring, students will be able to continue to apply for this if they're still enrolled in summer term or to a less to a more limited extent because we anticipate giving out most of it early to those who are enrolled in the fall term. So if you are experiencing financial hardship, you're having trouble paying your bills or your college expenses, please apply for this money and we can give you a, a link for that. Uh, however, that those funds which will be available are met specifically to help you get through this crisis to stay enrolled and to graduate in a timely fashion. The second part of care funding is covering COVID expenses and preparing for fall. Uh, we have already received quite a few reductions, particularly in areas like housing and dining services uh, because of uh, this pandemic. We will take some of the funds here and we will use them to develop better and more inclusive virtual and uh, online counseling and incentive programs for retention and virtual recruitment opportunities so that while people are still unable to access our campus in a full and complete way, they'll still be able to receive attention from us that can draw them in and help them with their need, whether it's telemedicine, telecounseling, teleadvising, or working with financial aid. We're available and we will continue to strengthen those services through some of this money. The balance of the funds will be used to help the university as we recover from the budget issues and challenges that we believe we're going to have. Now, on top of that, if there was ever a wonderful year to become a minority serving institution, this was the year. And having just received our certification in January, we were informed last week that as a minority serving institution, we're eligible for an additional $2.1 million in funding that can be used in a very flexible way to help our students stay in school and to offer services and support for them, as well as services and support for the programs and the educational programs that we have. So we thank the federal government for their support. <clears throat> this brings us to the big topic of budget. And while I can't give you a full and complete breakdown of every budget move that we're making, I want to try to lay it into a few different buckets so that you have an understanding of the challenges we face. We currently believe that be, uh, with our international student population being limited by visa application and the, by their ability to gain visas to come here, that we could have somewhere in the neighborhood of a 35 to $45 million shortfall come fall. This is a big number. It's not a number that's different in any way than the numbers all major universities are facing. The question is, how will we deal with it? This last, the last part of this fiscal year, we've recovered about $15 million. We will have about $10 million from CARE, uh, CARE Act funding part two, which makes a pot of about $25 million that we can reserve to help us pay our bills in the fall and continue our services for our students. Along with that, we're asking every unit to take 5% <clears throat> sustainable cuts and to prepare based off shortfalls in state funding and other shortfalls from enrollment up to a 10% budget reduction in their units. These are big numbers, but they're numbers that we can make, we can make do with, and we can make them sustainable by looking at better and more facile ways of doing business and by scaling our uh, costs to the enrollments and the enrollment shortfalls that we have. The budget preparations that we're making now should deliver something very close to the budget predictions that we're making for fall and should help us fill the hole that we have. Some of this funding, uh, some of this budget cutting will be sustainable. We will hope to recover around $18 million that we can use to reinvest in our educational mission and we can use to expand our educational services to our students in years to come. But for this year, we need to make sure that we're doing the best we can across the board. We're also cutting costs in other areas. We're reducing our budgets in areas of construction. We're putting projects on hold. We're putting some new initiatives on hold, not all. The ones that influence recruitment and retention are still front, uh, front of mind uh, and will be uh, funded. We are trying very hard to reduce costs everywhere we look. And for example, we don't anticipate lots of travel come fall. We don't anticipate a number of other things that 
we would have in a regular year. We're even reducing our paper expenses because we've gone virtually paperless. So <clears throat> as we look at the cuts that we're making, we believe that we'll emerge from this a healthier institution with a leaner budget, with better cost controls, and the ability to reinvest quickly to prepare and to continue to make the kinds of progress we have as one of the top universities on the rise in the country. The very last thing, and I know a lot of people have asked questions about that, the very last place we look after we've made every other possible budget move we can would be in any form of pay reduction or furloughing or layoff program. We will, right now, we have not made any firm decisions about this while schools across the country are doing it. It's part of our fiscal health and part of our solid leadership strategies that have allowed us to get to this point without having to do that. And so I want you to know our first task is to make sure we keep the Mean Green family together and to do the best we can to allow people to continue working in a gainful way. Um, that's all I'm gonna say for now about budget. Don't expect any final budget discussion until we get much closer to fall when we know the actual extent of what our enrollment might be and any shortfalls from the state uh, that we might experience. Finally, we anticipate beginning to gradually reopen the campus this summer. There'll be research activities that are occurring on campus that will slowly begin to return. Our uh, VP for research, Mark McClellan, has developed an extensive plan that I believe is very strong and very solid that will help us safely resume research. And bear in mind, in all we do, safety is the first concern, and you're gonna hear about that a little bit more from Elizabeth with. Uh, we believe that in summer two, we'll be able to open up learning to experiential classes, classes that need face-to-face -face experiences, music, art, engineering, lab classes, possibly even some small classes where very intense interactions are encouraged and graduate education. So we hope that in summer two, we'll begin to model what fall will look like. And come fall, we hope to have a limited but still more or less open campus. And of course, it, I need to reiterate, we will be doing all the things that are recommended by the health uh, officials in the county, the state and the federal government. We will have safe social distancing. We will wear masks. We will be washing and sanitizing. We will be deep cleaning and doing a number of other things that I believe will help to make sure that we're a healthy campus along with the monitoring and the testing that needs to happen if we're going to have a successful return to something approaching normal. If you read my letter, you know that normal isn't the same as a full-blown campus. We won't be having large events. In fact, there will be no large events that are approved uh, until, no large events will be approved until we get a green light from the federal government. We have a vaccine or something uh, that can treat the COVID uh, disease and make sure that we can be healthy even if we contract it. Uh, so these are major considerations for us. We think that a fall return is going to be something our students crave and many of our faculty and staff do. The final thing I wanna say about that is many uh, people have expressed concerns because they're in high risk groups. We will do everything we can to make sure that anyone in a high risk group continues to stay remote or telecommutes or has a very uh, safe and protected environments because we value every single individual in our Mean Green family. There'll be more, I'm sure you'll have more questions about this, and that's why I've brought the team forward. Although we don't know all the answers to everything yet because the situation's changing on an almost daily basis. So with that quick summary, I wanna now allow uh, your provost, Jennifer Cowley, to very briefly talk about the academic plans we have for beginning to reopen the campus in summer two and fall. Jennifer. Great, thank you very much, President Smatras. So I'm gonna walk briefly through the phase plan that we're approaching. So in the month of May, that is uh, starting now, we're beginning to prepare for research activities to resume. We're also allowing faculty and staff to return to their workspace for limited periods of time to collect any items that they may need to continue their telecommuting arrangement. Starting at the beginning of June with summer session one, we're going to allow limited access to certain students on campus to access experiential learning spaces, for example, MFA studios, practice spaces, 
or laboratories for uh, graduate teaching assistants and fellows to be able to record lectures that will be needed and lab experiments for the coming summer two session. In so, uh, we will continue telecommuting and offering virtual uh, student services during that period of time. Beginning with summer two, which starts on July 6th, we'll have a pilot allowing some of our clinical operations, some in-person teaching of experiential courses, and some hybrid student services to be delivered, allowing for students to access virtually or to come in person. This will then lead us to the fall where we're planning a hybrid delivery model. That means that we'll have a mix of in-person, remote, and online classes, as well as student services being available virtually or in person. We have charged the Learning Spaces Committee with coming up with a plan for how we can best safely use our existing classroom spaces to deliver education. That may mean social distancing, um, protective uh, PPE, or other ways that we can secure our environment and make it safer. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth With to be able to talk more about some of those safety protocols. Thanks, Jennifer. So keeping in mind that the health and safety of our campus community has been our priority from the beginning, um, there have been a lot of conversations that have been occurring about what's happening on our campus. And know that these conversations began on our campus in late January, just as the virus was picking up speed. We've had strategic conversations that have continued since then and will continue as well into the future as we work our way back into the reopening of campus. Um, there's a system level um, committee that meets. We've got university level com committees that meet, whether that be the cabinet or our emergency operations center that's still active or our emergency communications group. In addition, there have been division conversations as well as departmental conversations as well to ensure that all that we're doing has the health and safety of our campus community in mind. Moving forward, the system has agreed on some baseline, baseline um, requirements that each of the institutions within the system will have. They're all based upon the CDC guidelines. So just as the president mentioned earlier, um, they're dynamic, they're changing. So we can expect that some of these will be modified um, as we work our way into July and August and the openings that were that Jennifer discussed. So some of these things include, include having sanitizer available, sanitizing stations at the entrances in the main areas of, camp, of buildings across campus, um, social distancing, as well as masks. Now masks will be required when staff and faculty and students are coming into contact with others. Um, they won't be required when you're working, for example, in your office by yourself. Um, as long as you can maintain social distance, um, you would not be required one, but we want all to have a mask. Right now, the university is working to um, acquire as many masks as possible and we'll be providing those to faculty and staff. One of the decisions that is yet to be made is exactly well, whether we'll be re requiring students to bring their own or whether we'll be able to supply them for all of them as well as our visitors on campus. There will be common protocols around cleaning and sanitization of our buildings. Um, as we're working our way into returning on campus in July, there will be a deep cleaning across campus. Um, and then again, if areas are impacted, if we have a faculty or a staff member um, who contracts the virus, then obviously we would back in those areas, making sure that we're doing deep cleaning as well. Initially, we're going to require self-reporting of our temperature, so we're not we're going to require those at least as of yet. We have not made that decision, um, but we're going to require folks if you have symptoms and if you have a fever, you need to stay home, making sure that you don't get anybody else sick. Um, if folks are sick um, and have had the virus, then we will require a doctor's note for them to return to campus. For those who have symptoms while they're on campus, we'll have isolation spaces available. Most of those will occur at the Student Health and Wellness Center, but as we open the residence halls in the fall, then we'll have dedicated space within the residence halls for isolation. Social distancing will be very important, and so we'll have the floor markers that you've seen if you've been on campus already. Um, we'll make sure that we are reorganizing furniture, taking some furniture out of common spaces, um, having a great deal of signage, making sure that we have everything available for folks to understand what social distancing is. And know that all of the things that we've talked about, our finance and administration folks are working hard to procure. So um, sanitizing stations, hand sanitizer, 
masks, all those things are in the works and in being brought here. A couple of things that we're still working on and deciding what will happen is the cleaning of our personal spaces. Right now, custodians don't do that. Because of, safe, because of safety and security reasons. Um, so will we be required to clean our own spaces, provide our own cleaning uh, materials? Those are things that we're talking about still. Um, and know that the conversations around um, contact tracing as well as testing are continuing. I think the university is prepared to assist the health department in the contact tracing. Currently we are doing, um, we look at the campus exposure risk and we'll continue to do that. The EOC and members of that emergency communications group have done a great job in making sure that people who have had symptoms, we know where they've been, we know if they've been able in contact with people on our campus and we're going to continue to do that. Contact tracing takes that one step further and the health department leads that um, charge. And know that the governor, when he spoke a couple of weeks ago, he talked about contact tracing. And so we're working with our local health department in making those determinations and how we can help and best support them. Um, and then whether or not we do testing on our campus, we provide kits now. Um, our health and wellness center through the leadership of Dr. Cynthia Herman is looking at whether or not we should procure our own equipment and be able to do our own testing. Uh, we don't know whether we'll be able to, but we certainly would like to be able to um, if we can into the future. So with all of that in mind, know that the health and safety of our campus community is definitely our highest priority. And while there's still a lot to be done, we will continue our efforts moving in that direction with that at the forefront of what we do. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jim and the president to continue with the town hall. Uh, let's look at the next slide. So what I wanna to say to all of you is we've given you a brief introduction because we knew that that would cover many of the questions that you had. But today is really about looking at what we've done and listening to you not just asking, answering questions, but getting some commentary from you to guide us. I, I wanna say, by the way, uh, that I feel incredibly lucky that we've got an, a great team uh, who's helping us through this crisis. I don't think this would have gone half as well. I've been in contact every week with 30 to 40 different university presidents from around the country. And I will tell you that I believe our preparation and our responses have been better than those I've seen in any other major university in the country. So it doesn't happen without a good team. And I can't thank the folks in the leadership groups, the deans, and the many different or uh, force, task force operations that we have, like the Emergency Operations Center, uh, for keeping us moving forward during this time. Now, with that said, I need to ask you some questions. And I may have to answer a couple questions because in this town hall format, it takes a couple minutes before things filter through. So the first question I wanna ask you is, what's really gone well? And I'm gonna start off by saying a few things have gone well from where I sit. If you look at the team of Joey, Ed, and uh, Maureen McGinnis, uh, what you'll see is that they have worked incredibly rapidly to get our care funding out ahead of almost every other university so that we can support our students. Last week, we, were, we had already gathered over 6,000 applications while most of our uh, colleagues in other institutions had barely posted their sites and had received one or 200. They've done phenomenal work in a very short period of time and our students certainly uh, should express their gratitude to this team. Uh, I'll also say we've had some really wonderful kind of um, homebrew efforts. Uh, our CVAD team has been making, our, and our fashion group has been making masks. We've made PPEs, uh, plastic face shields, out of our uh, 3D printing capabilities. And our engineering group in the uh, additive manufacturing program has made ventilation splitters that allow ventilators to service more than one individual. These types of individual activities and many heroic acts on the part of our faculty and staff have really been the thing that I feel highlights the Mean Green family. So I don't know if I stalled long enough, but what I'd love to do is to begin addressing either your questions or to hear from you what you feel has gone really well. We'll follow that up with what hasn't gone as well and what we can do better and then any other questions that you still might have. So I'm turning it back to Jim now to see if uh, there's something I need to address or if we have some commentary. 
Thank you, President Smotris. As just a reminder for everybody who turned in, uh, tuned in a little bit late, you're viewing the Presidential Town Hall with UNT President Neil Smotris, Provost Cowley, and Vice President for Student Affairs, Elizabeth Wythe. This is Jim Bershey from UBSC, and I'll be asking questions off camera as they come in. So please do submit some of the questions related to what the President just outlined. Uh, President Smotros, we're going to start with something a little bit more on the light side, but very important to the students this week in particular. We've received several questions from seniors about whether or not they're allowed on campus in order to take pictures during this, what would have been their uh, commencement week. Well, let me point out that our campus has never in fact been completely closed. We have essential personnel here. We have 720 students living here, uh, none of whom have experienced any difficulties. And I see students as I drove in today taking pictures in front of Hurley Hall and the Eagle statues. So we invite students to come take pictures and celebrate uh, their graduation by uh, with their families. But we ask the following. If you're near any other groups, please re be respectful of social distancing. Please wear masks. You can take them off for your pictures, but stay quite far apart from each other so that we don't uh, risk spreading uh, this virus further. Thank you for that answer. And now we're gonna go to a question about a very important population at UNT, and that's our international students. We've had a student submit this question just now. Can international students take online classes in their home country because we cannot make it back to UNT in the fall of this year? I'll let Jennifer answer that question. Thanks. We are assessing the academic programs that have the highest concentration of international students, and we're working with the departments to determine a virtual delivery plan, particularly for the first semester of coursework for students who are not already here who would like to join those programs. For existing students, I would encourage you to reach out to your department to determine what courses may be available online for a continuing student who may not be able to return. Given that um, embassies are still closed and some borders are closed, we're waiting for further guidance from the federal government on borders and when our international students will be able to return to our campus. Thank you, Provost Cowley. So uh, Dr. Witt addressed this a little bit related to reopening campus and sanitizing, but someone has written in specifically about the use of the union given that there are so many different activities and offices and different centers in the union, and they're wondering just how much the union will be utilized. Is it half as much or try to reopen it fully? So let me start off and then let Elizabeth follow. First, I have to say uh, I screwed up. It should have been Melissa McGuire uh, who was doing the great work on the CARES Act. So uh, my, my shout out to Melissa for all of her hard work. Uh, you know, the student union is one of the great treasures of this campus, and it's a great gathering spot, but we will have to have a different kind of student union opening with appropriate student, with appropriate distancing, appropriate masking, and appropriate spacing out of events or rotating people in and out. I'll turn it over to Elizabeth because so much goes on there that uh, we really need to think this through deeply. This is one of the areas that we, I mentioned earlier that we just don't have all the answers to yet. And so we're continuing to have conversations. Some of our preliminary ideas for the union are having um, floor markers that indicate um, which way you should be walking so that people aren't bumping into each other as they're walking through the corridors of the union. When we think about um, being in line, making sure that there's six feet of spacing in between people as they're in line, if that, and if that's even possible, um, additionally, um, we know that we need more space for people to eat to be able to spread out. So we're looking at potentially util utilizing the small ballroom as an additional space for students to be able to eat when we open in the union. As I said, there's lots to consider, um, lots of ideas that are popping through, um, some things that have been, um, Neil in fact pointed out something to me that's being done in China where they're using cardboard to separate the spacing at, a ta at tables. We're willing to look at anything and we'll continue to look at anything to make sure that we're maintaining the health and safety of our campus community. Thank you, Dr. Wythe. President Smotras, we've had another question come in related to the uh, staff working on campus. And the question is, will part-time teleworking still be available 
for departments who want to limit the amount of people in an office at a given time in order to practice social distancing. Dr. Smatras, you're muted right now. <laughs> a common Zoom problem. <laughs> okay, uh, we don't ever wanna go back to the old ways of doing things. Whether it's going paperless or telecommuting, we believe that these things are part of our future. We, right now, uh, I feel better about telecommuting than I've ever felt. I think there's a market for it. I think that some form of rotation where we need face-to-face but we don't all have to be there all the time is in order in many of the different offices. Of course, we'll leave it to the supervisors and vice presidents to work out the details. But you know, one of the problems that we had was that everyone needed more and more and more office space to the extent that people were fighting over it. I think we can resolve those problems through rotating people in and out of their positions, hoteling uh, and through telecommuting. And so, I believe we will continue to telecommute, especially for those who are high risk populations. Thank you, President Smatras. Before we move on to the next question that has been submitted, just to remind you that the president would really like to hear these items that we have on the slide. What has gone well? What hasn't gone well? What can we do better? And any other questions? If you would push those through the chat feature, then we can see those pop up and we will ask the president, the provost, and Dr. Witt. So I know there was a mention earlier, especially by you, the Mr. President, and the provost about research, but we've had a question for a little bit more detail about what Vice President McClellan is doing in the area of research to restart operations and what that means for the research staff and the graduate students and how fast that might ramp up and at what level this summer. Well, I can offer a part of the answer here, and if we need to, Jennifer can embellish. Uh, Quite simply, we are very aware that many graduate students require access to research and research laboratories in order to make satisfactory progress. So as part of our research reopening plans, which are beginning this week in getting the core facilities back up to speed, uh, we will be including socially distanced, uh, limited lab bench uh, operations and the ability to bring graduate students as well as faculty research associates, postdocs, and faculty members back into the laboratory. Again, wearing masks and making sure that we're following all necessary safety protocols, not bringing in anyone who's displayed any of the symptoms of COVID, a temperature or some form of shortness of breath or other respiratory related issues. So uh, yes, graduate students will be able to come back and should be able to work However, the work environment may require rotations or limited use of space. Okay. Do you want to go to the provost for anything else or? You think, uh, uh, happy to hear Jennifer embellish this. Absolutely. This week we have started allowing pre-research activities to get started. That's the restarting of machinery, uh, restarting of our animal facilities. Beginning May 8th, researchers will begin to access their laboratory environment. Uh, we are holding uh, human subjects research that involves person-to-person -person contact on hold for the moment. And I encourage people to go to the Office of Research website. There's a research restart plan that you can read in detail, which has um, everything you need to know. And the Office of Research is holding a town hall meeting for principal investigators this Wednesday to review the details of the research restart plan. The basics are starting in May, we'll restart many of our research labs, and then we'll provide more guidance on when human subjects research that happens face-to-face -face can begin to occur. Thank you, Provost Kelly. And actually, Dr. McClellan just uh, texted me to remind people the uh, URL for that research plan is research.unt.edu. So what the provost just mentioned, you can go read all about it. And again, the uh, town hall, he's encouraging everybody to participate from 10 to 11 a.m. so you can learn more. So President Smatras, we have received one of the uh, listening to you questions or a comment that I'd like you then to maybe uh, comment on. Uh, it says, I am proud of how quickly we moved to a telecommunity workforce and kudos to our IT departments to work countless hours to meet all those needs, well done. 
Couldn't agree more, boy. Uh, if it wasn't for our fast response on Zoom and Teams, uh, none of, and the great work that's been done through, uh, for example, Adam Fine's shop for Canvas and how we're letting people do better with remote delivery, we could not have done this. So IT teams deserve a big hearty round of applause from all of us. Thank you. All right, so let's move on to the uh, next question, which falls into the category of what hasn't gone well, which I know you want to hear uh, and respond to. Uh, it has to do more with graduate students, which may be something the provost might want to jump in on as well. Uh, I think there's a general feeling based on the message. The undergraduates have been a big focus of a lot of what we've been talking about, but maybe some graduate students feel a little bit neglected in some ways. So maybe we talk about that and uh, what we have been doing for graduate students or what the plans are for the future. Absolutely, I'm happy to address that question. The needs of our graduate students are somewhat unique from the needs of our undergraduate students. And we have taken a number of actions that we believe uh, will support our graduate students moving forward. Um, one, we have uh, put in place extensions on a case-by-case -case basis of students who have reached the end of their studies that need additional time in order to be able to get to graduation. Um, we have provided for students in their fifth or sixth year of their doctoral studies the ability to extend um, their fel uh, fellowships or assistantships for an additional semester to account for progress that may have mit uh, been missed this semester. Um, we have a new remo remote learning training course that we have put together to help uh, those who will be teaching in the fall get prepared and teaching fellows as well as uh, full-time faculty members are eligible for that support. Uh, that will be rolling out in the next couple of days, allowing people to uh, receive a little bit of funding that recognizes the effort that is going into helping promote remote learning. Those are a few of the examples. Um, we have also added in response to graduate student council's proposal a uh, amended appeals process for concerns about grades. So those are just a few of the examples, Jim, of some of the responses that we have to concerns that have been raised by graduate students. Thank you, Provost Cowley. And both to you and President Smotris, I want to just uh, share one of the gone well comments. And it is, I have really appreciated the great communication from the president and the provost during this time. So you don't necessarily need a response unless you want to, but I wanted to share that with you. We'll make sure that everybody continues to be communicated with. We really appreciate the daily letter that's coming out uh, from your shop, Jim, and uh, the details of these plans as they roll out will be shared broadly with the campus so that you know what to expect. All right, so the next question is one again about financial assistance, and it's possible somebody may have joined a little bit late and not heard everything you said at the beginning. President Smotrisk about the CARES Act, but specifically it says, will there be any additional financial assistance for the fall semester? Well, we anticipate that most of our CARE funding will be, about three quarters of it will be gone by the end of summer, that about one quarter of it <clears throat> will be held in abeyance to support students in the fall. So we do anticipate that there'll be another round of emergency grant and aid for students who are enrolled, who are having trouble paying their bills. Thank you, President Smotrisk. And the next one comes from a staff member who is asking more about when staff can expect to be back on campus. I know it's varying by division, but is there a general expectation that a majority of staff will be back on by early June or mid June or around that time? Or So we haven't set a specific time frame for this yet. In fact, tomorrow we have an extended discussion with the leadership team to begin establishing some guidelines. Obviously, if uh, the virus spikes, if new cases spike, uh, it'll change everything. So the first thing we're going to do is be guided by the data and guided by the science. But the next thing that I'll tell you is that we anticipate that staff will begin coming back in June in a very limited way, and more staff will be available to come back in July as we begin to ramp up for modified but more normal kinds of operations. I'd look over at Elizabeth and Jennifer if they want to add to this. I'm happy to speak for the Division of Student Affairs. Um, we'll con we're continuing to have these conversations, and as the um, 
If the time comes for us to begin ramping up and training for housing and dining, for example, those are probably some of the first staff that will come back. Some of them have not left yet. Obviously, we have residents and um, Neil, you spoke to that a little while ago. And so um, that's likely where the initial phase of staff coming back in the Division of Student Affairs will be in our auxiliary areas. Um, but what I would encourage staff within the Division of Student Affairs, continuing ask, continue to ask your supervisor and have those conversations because those directives will be coming from your supervisor. A ditto on what Elizabeth said, we're starting to bring people back uh, that support our students, both in the classroom and through student services. And that will happen slowly uh, beginning July 6th and then moving forward, um, we'll phase in staff coming back with a portion of folks continuing to telecommute throughout the fall semester. For the next one, let's go back to Dr. Witt for just a minute because this question has to deal with the housing and residence life. And uh, it's actually a comment and then a question for me. So the comment from one of our viewers is that housing and residence life hall teams have been amazing with assisting students in the move out process and answering questions. So kudos to that team. And you might wanna expand on some of those folks. But also I think a lot of people have been talking about the fact that we have housed so many people on campus for the rest of the spring that needed a home and uh, the safety has been the number one thing. So maybe you address that as well. I'd love to, because that staff has worked really hard from the get-go. They've been really on the front lines, um, probably as much as anybody and maybe even more so, um, along with our folks in dining in our health center. And so um, kudos to, to um, Danny Armitage and Gina Vanacor and all their folks in housing. They've done a wonderful job of managing um, all of it. And so think about trying to figure out how to um, schedule move out for folks that need to leave um, while still maintaining social distance, while still trying to um, abide by the shelter in place orders. They've done a really great job. Um, what I'm also really pleased um, and appreciative of is the fact that we were able to provide housing for those students that need it. Um, currently, we have almost 700 students still living in the residence halls. They'll shut down as normal at the end of this week as we would have expected them to. But we had quite a few students who had no other place to go, whether it was international students or some of our students who have aged out of the foster care system. Um, we knew that they would have been homeless if we'd have closed the hall. So um, I'm really pleased that our students, some students have the opportunity to stay. It's taught us some lessons. It's given us the opportunity to, if you will, practice what it's like to social distance in the residence halls. And so I think we'll take some of these lessons that we've learned and utilize them for the fall as we work to open housing on a more full um, scale. Thank you, Dr. Witt. And we're going to go back to the president momentarily, but let me just uh, add a comment. Uh, our senior vice president, Bob Brown, has texted based on the response that you had and a question just now, Dr. Witt. And that is about uh, a reminder that the facility staff has been here and will continue to be here all summer preparing the campus and perform the necessary cleaning. So it's the staff that uh, Elizabeth mentioned from her area and a lot of other teams as well. And I, I want to say thank you to all of those groups. And I'm sure President the Provost and Dr. Witt recognize that it's a big team effort to get all the facilities ready. I think we all have earned great new appreciation for our frontline services and the people who are still out there working. My hat's off to you. I know we all really care. And without you, we couldn't do this. So they deserve a debt of gratitude. Uh, you know, I see a whole lot of really positive comments. International students says they felt really good and comforted and taken care of. I've heard advising has gone really well online. I see that people are very happy with the level of communication that's gone on. Um, and that uh, there's some folks who think their teachers have done phenomenally, and then there's some folks who think maybe not so much, uh, but that doesn't surprise me, I think. Uh, one person though asked a question, I think it would be great for Jennifer to uh, look at, and it's will Scott spot scores be made available to help us do a better job with uh, online classes going forward, Jennifer? 
absolutely. We have we're collecting spot scores because we think it's particularly important to understand what our students experience has been this semester. Mm -hmm. Those spot scores will not be used in the annual evaluation or promotion and tenure processes. But as soon as we have the spot scores that we'll be distributing those out to department chairs and to individual faculty members, that way they can see the feedback and make any adaptations that they may need in preparing for next semester's classes. One of the other things I noticed, Jim, is that a lot of comments have been uh, that the responses of the different groups people are in have been enhanced because of the flexibility that's been offered. I, I think this is a really important point. What has gone well? In a situation like this, you have to be flexible. You can't be policy ridden or allow barriers to slow you down. And so I think that the whole campus is adapted to the get or done attitude as opposed to we're going to follow this a uh, set of rules that will slow us up. So uh, very happy to see that people are pleased with the flexibility that allows us to um, make good judgments about how to keep people safe and how to keep things moving. Well, sometimes a crisis in a crisis, you find out new things that you didn't know or help implement new policies. So that's a good thing. Uh, one thing that's on people's minds uh, is all the activity we have around athletics, which of course, it falls a big time I'd like to know uh, when that's going to resume because one person wrote we need the joy of our mean green football. Well, let me just jump in and say first I'm uh, <clears throat> on the Conference USA executive board and I'm also a board member with the NC2A. Last week we had a teleconference that outlined a plan for how to safely roll out college athletics come fall. I'm not sure that we'll be talking about spectator based athletics but I believe that we'll have a plan that will allow football, basketball, uh, the many different Olympic sports, soccer and softball uh, to all continue. And the only challenges might be around travel and travel schedules and the types of testing protocols that we use to make sure that we can keep our students safe because these are all sports in which social distancing cannot be practiced. So. We're going to be looking at it. We're going to be following the Open America plan as well as the NC2A uh, reopening athletics plans. And we will follow uh, all the guidelines that our public health officials uh, have given us. Uh, one, the Another option, by the way, is that we may have a football season. The football season could be truncated. Uh, it could be a shorter season that involves more local play uh, or championship play. So keep your fingers crossed. I'm looking forward to football as, as much as anybody. Thank you, President Smotris. Uh, we're going to go back to Dr. Witt for just a minute because we have a pre-submitted question that came in a few days ago, which was a uh, shout out to the Student Health and Wellness Center. Uh, I know that Dr. Herman and her team has been very busy over there, and I thought maybe Dr. Witt might like to comment on that particular group of folks and also just what they're doing right now for students and the plans for the summer and the fall uh, one of the parts of this question had to do with helping calm fears and anxieties. So I know there's counseling, but also the Student Wellness Center overall. So would you like to talk about that, Elizabeth? Sure, I'd be happy to. We've utilized the staff at the Health Center the entire time. They are our resident experts. So as we've looked at the health and safety of our campus, um, physicians have been involved all along the way. So um, kudos and shout outs to Dr. Cynthia Herman and, and Dr. John Shelton. They've done great work for us and have been involved in many of the committees and still are. Um, they, as you know, I think many of you know, uh, we shut down the facility except for um, acute care over these last few weeks because um, we didn't want to bring students into an well students into an environment where we had six students and so we were just able to get past that as of last Friday they've opened back up and have normal operations um, resuming their normal summer operations um, so not quite as many folks um, in, from a staffing perspective in the health center but they're going to be able to accommodate all the needs for our students that they've been able to so not just if you're sick but if you need um, a well woman exam, for example, or if you need um, shots for allergies, those types of things are open and available and will continue to be so. Um, I do think it's important to be uh, to mention the mental health of our campus community and specifically of our students. This time has been very difficult on all of us and um, some are taking this quarantine better than others. And so I think the being able to have counselors available 
um, has been really helpful to our campus community, to our students. And so shout out to all those folks and I appreciate their work. Um, they were able to move really quickly um, providing virtual counseling for our students and haven't missed a beat. And so I'm grateful that that will continue. And so I think we've discovered um, as part of um, this new normal that we're about to embark upon, some of the things that we've discovered that we can do some of these services pretty darn well virtually, and that will continue. And I think it will allow us to expand the numbers and be able to provide more support for more of our students. And I look forward to that coming in the fall. Hey, Jim, I noticed an awful lot of kudos out there for our faculty who've done a great job, for our housing and residential life folks, for folks in dining, but I'm seeing a whole lot around IT. And I just think, uh, I, I just want everyone to know uh, the comments that you've made about what has gone well, and they've been almost overwhelming. The number that I'm getting popping up here in the Q&A is really heartwarming. Uh, I, I'm so happy that people are appreciative of the really great services that they've been getting from so many of our faculty and staff and even uh, many of our students. So thank you all, they're really kind, uh, kind comments. I think it might be worthwhile right now to move to the trickier topic. What is it we need to do better? And, and I wanna start with one, just because I'm kind of chuckling as I read it. What can we do better? Not stress departments with five and 10% budget cuts. Well. I get it, uh, but you know what? We have a choice here. We can lose a lot of people and a lot of our energy and momentum, or we can all take a little bit of the burden so that we can keep our Mean Green family alive and healthy, so that we can make sure that our students are getting the support they need, and we can meet the mission of helping our students thrive and helping them to do wonderfully when they graduate. So. Uh, we'll, we will not take any cuts lightly. I'm sorry that people are stressed by them, but we're all in this together. We're family. And when family works together, we grow together and we solve our problems and we come out of this stronger than ever together. Okay, what else hasn't gone well? Well, while we wait for those to come in, President Smatras, uh, we had a question related to how we will make the decision, and maybe this is something for the provost, I don't know, but about the decision about which classes this fall will be online versus in person. Thanks, Jim. We're currently charging our learning spaces committee with looking at all of our classroom spaces across campus, as well as other spaces that are typically used for events that we may be able to use for classroom purposes. We're calculating what can be done within social distancing, understanding the unique circumstances in certain courses. For example, I heard from a lecturer today that teaches foreign language, that enunciation is critical and wearing a mask may make teaching more difficult. Uh, we're looking at all of those factors and coming up with a plan for how many sections we can offer in person and how to do that most safely. We're also asking our departments and colleges to prioritize who um, should get the space first. So we're gonna prioritize those experiential learning um, experiences uh, first and foremost. And we're gonna uh, prioritize students that need to make timely progress to their degrees. All of this is being taken into consideration to figure out how we can safely support as many students as possible on campus and their learning in the fall semester. We do know some things can easily go online or remote for the fall. For example, we know that we have existing course sections that are online, and there may be multiple course sections, some in person, some online. We've asked that those go ahead and move online so that we can create additional classroom space for other courses that may more urgently need it. We're, uh, our plan is by July 1st to have a firm plan in place so that everyone will know exactly what's happening with each individual course section for the fall semester. So please stay tuned and have patience as the Learning Spaces Committee and our department chairs work with our faculty to come up with the best plan for how we can support our students learning. You know, I have a, a comment uh, to make here. Uh, one of the groups that I think has not been praised quite enough. Uh, and I noticed the comment here on it. Uh, <clears throat> it w before we had the CARE Act funding, uh, we began uh, an emergency grant and aid program based off donations and UNT CARES. And I know that the uh, 
advancement program has really pushed the message out there that a lot of folks have made contributions that our alumni are very motivated to help students and the funds that we have are more flexibly utilized than the CARE Act funding. So I wanna give a huge shout out to our donors this year. And by the way, despite the fact that the stock markets crash and that pandemics have a very wet blanket effect on donations, I believe that we'll hit our fundraising targets for this year because we've got the best donors anywhere. I really appreciate all of you and all of you who have given, thank you so much. Your hearts are in the right place and you make a difference for our students. Thank you, President Smatras. So before we move on to the next question, I wanna read one of those shout outs that you were talking about and the great comments coming in. Uh, again, from an international student, we know how important this particular population of students is to the university to have the diversity on campus. And this international student says, I have felt so much so safe and secure from the kind of support we have received from the university, be it financial, psychological, mental, and emotional. Thank you so much. I don't know if you'd like to comment on that, President Smokers. I don't think I can comment on it. It's a brilliant comment, and I think it typifies what we are as a community that we do really care about our students and try to take care of them. Thank you. So the next question has to do with uh, something that I know has been on the mind of students. And the question is, will students that currently have work study jobs continue to be paid in the summer if they received a summer work study award? So students who are on federal work study, uh, and I'm gonna look at Elizabeth and Jennifer, uh, we have not had crisp guidance on, but we have done our best to keep students who are on federal work study or state work study funded during this period. Uh, they'll all be funded through at least May 31st, and then we have to take a look at the fund and fund distributions that remain uh, depending on their positions and what they do. We have taken many of our students and we've retasked them into making phone calls, into helping to do virtual tours and all uh, other types of activities. We'll continue to try to find creative approaches to keeping as many of our students funded as possible. Right, thank you, President Smokers. Now let's go on to one that's in the category of what has gone well and what can we do better? And I think maybe the provost might want to address this particular one. Somebody wrote in to say that a lot of this person's teachers, professors, have done live lectures that were great and fun, but there were some faculty members who just posted slides and didn't do much else. And as we go into the potential for more, of course, online during the summer, but the fall, uh, do you care to address that, Provost Kelly? Absolutely. I think we can all understand that everybody was responding to the health crisis and our faculty um, as well as our staff have different levels of technology uh, skills. One of the things that we're focusing on is upskilling all of our faculty over the summer. So we have a remote delivery training course that we're asking all of our faculty to participate in. And our CLEAR uh, office is standing up a whole series of training sessions that begin the week of May 11th to upskill. So it's going to be covering a range of topics from accessibility to copyright to uh, leading better discussions. All of those things are designed to really help support our faculty as they do the very best job they can to deliver a great education for our students. So the CLEAR website has more information and I'll post a link that can be shared with our community about where they can find the training schedule. All right, thank you, Provost Cowley. Here's one that uh, administrators uh, like to hear because sometimes we feel like that we're inundating the campus community, but maybe the president would like to address this or make a comment. Somebody wrote in to say that communication from the university administration has gone well. Better to be overwhelmed than not to find out what's going on. Well, you know, they always say in a crisis you can't communicate enough. It's been our plan that we push out and be, are available for the kinds of questions people have. We know that some people have uh, expressed some frustration in not knowing where we're going. I think you can see over the next two weeks that there are going to be the beginning of very crisp plans articulated across campus in each of the major divisions for how we're going to coordinate our re-entry into the fall and the impacts that this will have on us. So uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, again, though, uh, Jim, I have to thank your division 
which has done a great job in helping us to push out communications that everyone can get. Thank you, President Smokros. And just a quick plug for everybody who's been reading the COVID daily updates that we've been sending out. In about two weeks, we're going to launch something new called UNT Today that will replace those updates and be permanent where you'll receive a daily news digest of the various activities going on around campus. So more information will be coming out soon, but you'll have a regular sort of a digest of information that you'll be able to read going forward about what's going on on campus to keep you informed. So here's a comment uh, that has come in, Mr. President, that maybe also you will want to address. Somebody said the flexibility given to supervisors has gone well. I believe supervisors have and will continue to assess the needs of the university and the particular area and make sound decisions. And if that means continued telecommunity, and I hope we will act accordingly. But I may say something about the supervisors that have been trying to figure all this out during this difficult time. Uh, I anticipate telecommuting is here to stay, not just through the COVID crisis, but to the extent that it helps to alleviate space, uh, build us building, having more built space around officing. Uh, you know, uh, the shared services building, the SSB, is a great example of how hoteling space and spaces that can be made available can accommodate quite a few people. If, say, 25 to 30 percent of all of our employees rotate in and out or telecommute, uh, especially those who, by the way, are at high risk during this crisis, then we don't have a space problem anymore. Along with that, though, I, I've been reading some of the uh, comments that didn't get published here, and I'm kind of interested. A lot of people are saying, well, I work in a cubicle firm. Uh, do I have to wear a mask? And I'm alarmed. Well, when you're in a private office with a closed door, you don't have to wear a mask. When you're in a cubicle firm and there's people sitting next to you and you can see them, you need to wear a mask. I hope that's a simple and direct answer for you. All right, thank you, President Smotros. I think we're gonna go to Provost Cali for this next one because it's again something about graduate school and a question. Uh, the question is, is there any fast tracking graduate school admissions to allow the jobless to quickly return to school? UNT could provide an important service for those who need opportunity and professional growth over the next year. Thanks, Jim. So yes, um, we have in response to the current health crisis recognized that many of our testing centers are closed and students are not able to take GREs. Uh, we recognize that students who may not have originally planned to go back to graduate school are now considering coming back to graduate School. Most of our graduate programs have extended application deadlines and are providing flexibility for provisional admissions or to waive certain test requirements. So I encourage anybody interested in thinking about graduate school to reach out to the academic program of interest and talk to the program coordinator to determine what options there may be for enrolling this summer or fall. All right, and the next one is also for you, Provost Cowley, so we'll just stay with you for a minute. Uh, it has to do with travel uh, and travel plans and how folks can afford travel and, and go through that process related to, uh, you know, interacting with the international division. Absolutely. So currently um, we have travel prohibitions in place and we're asking that um, no one engage in uh, business related uh, travel for the time being. This is directly related to the CDC's travel advisories that, uh, that say we should not be engaged in non-essential travel. So we're putting limitations on travel at the present time. We'll be following CDC guidance and as that CDC guidance changes, then we'll be alerting our university community. I saw that there was a question related to someone who is currently abroad and seeking to come back. I'd encourage that person to reach out directly to UNT International to discuss their individual circumstance so we can determine what may be possible. All right, thank you, Provost Cowley. And I think we'll go back to Dr. Witt for a second because again, people have been coming in and out, but this is one that has popped up again that I know that uh, has been on folks' minds. So Dr. Witt is, the question is, is it possible to put the plexiglass at the front desk in the halls to get ready for all the people to move in? So I know you, you touched on this earlier, but you might want to explain again where that and some of the other safety measures that you're thinking are the initial rollout. So that's definitely one that's up for discussion. 
And um, I think we'll continue to see that. I think there's some areas that have specifically requested that. I don't know that all areas will be doing the same things. I think that's part of the conversation that we need to continue. Um, but know that um, there are a group of folks that include physicians that are taking a look at these safety measures and helping to make recommendations on what we need to do. We'll continue to follow the CDC guidelines and we'll implement all of these things as we begin to open in July and August. Um, everything is on the table and we will um, work to consider everything and anything that can work for us on our campus to help keep our campus community safe. Right, thank you, Dr. With. We're going to go back to the president for a question that was submitted in advance about uh, related to parents and future students who, according to this, uh, as they say, are eager to join us in the fall. So it's a two part question. For some of us, our financial situation has changed since the pandemic started. Is there any plan to revise the fee structure? And will UNT be granting deferrals to incoming freshmen? If so, will students be allowed to keep freshman university merit scholarships? Well, uh, let's deal with the second one first. Uh, I have not yet considered whether we'll grant deferrals. Obviously, deferral is an individual choice that someone makes depending on uh, their uh, motivation, their financial condition, uh, and their the timetable they have for their own success. Uh, I suspect that we will work with any student who feels that they're unable to attend in fall to try to help them. As far as merit scholarships go, we have not made a decision about that. Typically, we hand out our merit scholarships uh, based off of the application for that year. So I don't know if we would ask for a reapplication or not. And again, I'm not necessarily qualified to address that. As far as uh, the other question was based off fees um, in general, is that, and, and I'm, trying to, was it fees in general or was it just specific to the mandatory fees that we face? Well, it just says, is there any plan to revise the fee structure? And, you know, we've seen a lot of questions about when we're online versus in person and what fees might be charged. Well, so let's start off by what we did this summer. This summer, we actually rebated the fees for all, uh, all the mandatory student fees that people pay that they might not have received the service on. But I've got a I really have something important to say about fees because I think pe most people actually don't really understand how we calculate fees and what we do with them. Student fees are calculated on an hourly or daily use uh, basis. They cover the long-term costs of offering students all the services that we have, even if they can't use them at that moment. They include things like equipment, maintenance, staffing, uh, our buildings, uh, the student union and the rec center are covered by fees. In fact, the state says we can't cut a fee that pays for the uh, debt service on a building that we've constructed. The library fee, for example, covers the development and maintenance of library materials that students use to complete coursework, whether it's online or in person. And that includes materials they've checked out uh, for use at home, like laptops, which we've been handing out. Uh, and so fees are not something that we can turn off and turn on. And while an actual prorated uh, refund of fees would probably have a fairly minimal impact for each individual, the collective detrimental impact of not funding student fees to our community and our ability to operate our campus would be really a major hit to this institution and our ability to open back up. Come fall, we anticipate a mix of online courses, remote courses, remote courses and live courses. We hope every student gets to have some kind of live experience, but the campus will be open. They'll be able to use the student union. They'll be able to use the rec center. So right now we don't anticipate reducing those fees because we believe we can safely operate those facilities and allow students to access them. However, if we go to a more severe situation, we will certainly try to understand and assess what the most fair response that we can make is. So uh, I know it's a sensitive issue, uh, I know there'll be people who don't like the answer that I've given, but I wanna be transparent and I wanna be clear with everybody so that you understand the position that we're taking. All right, thank you, President Smotrosk. And uh, we'll either stay with you or go to Dr. Witt, depending on if you wanna answer this or not, but uh, it has to do with Greek life. And the question is, I assume from a student, will the Greek life recruitment be allowed in the fall or is that considered a quote, big event? Do you want me to take that one, Neil? I'll be happy to. 
So um, we are continuing to evaluate that process and the way it's delivered. Um, yes, we anticipate that we will have Greek recruitment in some form or fashion next year. And I'm saying next year because I don't want to commit to the fall semester. Um, although know that our Greek life staff and our students that are part of those Greek letter organizations very much want to hold recruitment activities as we as we launch in the fall. Um, things will likely look very different as many of our programs will as we enter into the fall semester. Greek life is but one of them, um, but no, we're committed to that population. We're committed to those organizations and we're working with um, national headquarters as well as our, our local alumni chapters to ensure we do it in the best way possible. Thank you, Dr. With. And the next one, I think we'll go back to the provost because it is uh, a mention of what's going well, but you might have a comment about, uh, to the president's point, what can we do better in this regard and what will we be doing in the future? Someone wrote that uh, moves to offer professional development for faculty who want to learn new online teaching strategies is going very well. But do you have any comments about future work in this area, Provost Cowley? Sure, we have heard very positive feedback and I, I give a shout out to all of our team members in CLEAR for doing such a great job in developing that remote delivery course. What we have heard is a desire for more detailed training in specific areas. And so, for example, I had a conversation with university libraries today about putting together a training session around copyright and how to move materials online for students to access that may be enrolled in a remote or online course in the fall semester. So uh, we feel really good about our ability to be able to deliver more specialized programming to support the individual needs of our faculty members. Thank you, Provost Cowley. Uh, back to the president for a minute. President Smatras, I've been noticing, and I know you probably have too on all the comments, so many kudos that are coming in uh, related to their colleagues across campus. There's very few that are critical of how anybody has been handling yeah. This, this global health crisis related to UNT. And I wondered if you wanted to speak for a minute about what that says about the Mean Green family and how we persevere and uh, just get through these tough times. You know that our hallmarks are caring, creativity, and resilient. And I like to believe that all of those hallmarks have been displayed uh, in its an incredible, uh, an incredibly positive way over the past uh, few weeks and few months. Uh, I will tell you that it takes a dedicated team working together who puts the good of the institution, the good of our students ahead of any of their own personal agendas. And I've seen that. I've seen us pull together. You know, I think there's institutions where they've begun to pull apart. That's not what we do. We stay together. We're flexible. We work with each other and we solve problems because our first commitment is our mission our mission to our students. So uh, again, I'm just thankful to everybody who's been so cooperative and so collaborative and so positive through this uh, very challenging situation. And I can't thank people enough. You know, Jim, I noticed there's a, a, a lot of questions about budgeting. There are a number of uh, very specific questions about um, veterans. I, I wanna say I'm not, I know Elizabeth can probably address some of those questions, but what I wanna say is they're, they're somewhat technical and I think they deserve individual responses. Elizabeth, what I'd like to do is say, we have a lot of questions about how we'll roll out veteran services. I know that that's in your area of, of concern. Uh, hopefully we can have some targeted communications in our daily and on our website, specifically for how veterans can access the services and support that they need. Elizabeth, do you want to address that? Sure, I'll be happy to. Um, I know that um, those folks are available now and have been virtually. Yes. And so if they continue to utilize um, the contact information on the website um, to reach veteran yeah. services, they, sh they should be able to reach somebody. If they don't, then make sure that folks know that we know. But um, I know that Jim Davenport and others involved with enrollment management from either the registrar's office or financial aid have been <coughs> available for students as well. And I think some of those folks have actually ventured, some of them have ventured back to campus already or will be doing so soon. So all of that should be available to them now. I saw a question about books and when the bookstore will be open. Um, we're planning 
waiting for the bookstore to be open um, come June 1. And so, um, but if folks are looking for books now and need them, they certainly can go online and order them um, through Barnes and Noble or other entities. And so I'd encourage those folks to do that as well. Um, but we'll get some information together and, and get it to Jen so that it can be posted in the daily that's more specific about veteran services. It's a good question. Yeah, uh, I'm looking at a lot of questions here um, around food and food security and dining services. So uh, first, uh, we will definitely have to make plans to socially distance in the dining halls. Again, uh, we've addressed that briefly. Elizabeth, I know, is working on it, but there's people who have asked, will there continue to be grab and go? I'm almost 100% certain that we will continue to have grab and go to support students who uh, need to either get a meal quickly and then go back to study or who don't want to be exposed uh, in the broader confines of dining services. Uh, the other thing is, will the food pantry be open? Uh, and I'm going to turn to Elizabeth because I know that this has been a critical resource for many of our students. And in fact, another campaign that I'd love it if Advancement in Student Affairs ran was in a, in a time when we think supply chains are breaking. If we open up our food pantry, can we all really pull together and help stock it up so that students can have access to food for those who have food insecurity. So yes, happy to address that. And the food pantry, as soon as we are uh, comfortable with more folks being on campus, um, the food pantry will again open. Right now we've been directing folks to off-campus food pantry locations and have worked to support them in ways that we can. Um, and for for those students that are on campus, that was one of the questions um, about what about students who are on campus who don't have meal plans? So those folks that are living in the residence halls and um, we made the decision to feed everybody. So whether or not if you're living in the residence halls, you're one of our 700 students and you don't currently have a meal plan, um, we're feeding all of them three meals a day um, not their fault. And a challenge for them. We wanted to make sure that they had meals as well. Um, so that's one of the reasons why uh, we closed the food pantry because we did not want to drive people from off campus on campus and we were feeding the people who were already on campus. I anticipate the food pantry to open. Um, I know those folks would appreciate and do appreciate the support they're receiving. Um, there's great support for the food pantry um, and has been um, for the last while. And so um, for those that have, have supported, we appreciate it and look for more support in the future. Yeah, and on another note, Elizabeth, you and I, we were talking, someone asked a question about will gowns for grads be available so that people can go out and get pictures. Um, and I'm, and I'm going to, again, disappoint some people with this answer. Uh, gowns are a way of transmitting virus and require strict cleaning protocols if we're going to not transmit virus. So for the safety of our campus, we won't be lending out gown for grad for, uh, for until we have a real walk across the stage graduation. And speaking of a walk across the stage graduation, while we'd hope to do it in August, I'm not convinced that we'll be able to sustain that uh, at the level that we want, which is uh, the super pit being full for four or five graduate, uh, well, not four or five, for eight or nine graduation ceremonies. Uh, I anticipate that we will probably be rolling graduation into something like the fall ceremonies. Uh, let me be clear that this breaks my heart. Uh, I, I'm really sad that I can't shake your hands as you walk across the stage. I'm really sad that students won't get to celebrate, but there are some celebrations planned at the college level. Uh, there are, I've, I will be sending out an announcement congratulating people and uh, spoiler alert, maybe there'll be a special little gift that comes to people in the mail here in the not too distant future uh, to congratulate you on graduating in what is arguably the most unusual graduation year in the past hundred or more years. Thank you, President Smokros. As we know, people come in and out of uh, town halls like this and especially online. And so uh, we want to just repeat something as we near the end. Could you cover again about CARES Act? Uh, we have some students asking about how they would be able to apply and sort of what uh, what that means. Oh, I'm sorry, apply for what? You broke up a second. Uh, apply related to the CARES Act funding uh, or any yeah, other financial aid in that regard. Uh, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, and I, it's tiny URL and I can't remember the name of it. But we have two we have two sites you can go to. One's more indirect. Uh, Jim, you've published the CARES Act site several times. I'm going to ask that you continue to publish it. I want everyone here to please read their COVID daily, uh, which is 
at UNT um, Health unt.edu. Is that right, Jim? It's the health alert site, yes. If you go to yeah. health alerts and health alerts, that's it. it. Yes, then you'll find uh, so that information. You can find the URL there. And also, if you are concerned with other types of services or support, uh, you can also go to the Save and Source site, which is a compendious listing of many different types of support now offered both virtually and uh, live. So those are the two places that I would ask. And yes, students can continue to apply. If you've received a gift in a semester, uh, I'll ask you to wait till the next semester uh, before you apply your next semester enrolled, before you apply again. Hey, Jim, I got a note that's kind of curious and I want to follow through on it uh, about the use of um, VPN. Uh, they say VPN is a little cumbersome but Cognos 11 seems to freeze, so it's really hard to manage the budget. Uh, so I just want, I, I, that's something that hasn't gone well and that we need to do better. Uh, I'm not sure what the challenge is specifically, if it's the bandwidth of the individual in their home or if it's something around Cognos because it's such a, a large uh, program. But I will uh, assure you that we'll look into that with Chris McCoy, our uh, head of IT, our VP for IT. On that topic, uh, Chris Matros, I know you've been working a lot and talking a lot with uh, our CIO, Chris McCoy, about just technology challenges. And I know Adam Fine has been involved in that discussion. Um, how do you think that has gone? We've got a lot of kudos from people, but a few people saying they had some rough patches. Overall, do you feel like that uh, it's been very sustainable through the semester? And are there any plans for going forward to make any changes? Well, one thing I've been shocked at is that Zoom and Teams have continued to operate despite the fact that the volume through them has just skyrocketed on an international level. Uh, our volume, and I can't remember the exact numbers, went from very few Zoom meetings a day to literally thousands and thousands of Zoom meetings uh, a day. So the fact that we're still working and operating, even though some people experience freeze ups, is great. Uh, most of the freeze ups that we've been able to identify are freeze ups that happen on your link at home. They're on the internet side uh, of home. The reason I'm up in the office today is because my internet tends to freeze up when we try to do really big events. So uh, I'll just say uh, for some folks, the ability to come back to campus may make Zooming better, but obviously we want uh, large numbers to telecommute or we won't be able to socially distance for the next uh, few months. So uh, hang in there. Sorry that things lock up, but all in all, uh, I'm very, very impressed, and we will continue to use and expand uh, our Zoom meetings because, frankly, the commute time's awesome. Uh, you don't, you know, I save a whole lot of time. Of course, I'm also in a whole lot more meetings than I used to be. I'm sure a lot of people are Zoomed out right now. Okay, we're going to ask a couple of more questions, and then I think move into a wrap-up that uh, you might want to do, President Smartros. Uh, there's a question that just came in and it really falls into that category of what can we do better uh, also not gone well but someone in commented that as we cut some employee positions uh, during the spring uh, there wasn't good assistance in terms of exit counseling and helping them search for other jobs and just wondering what you have to say about that well i mean the fact that students are who we care for the most suggests to me that it would be great if we could really communicate with them although I know that many units like student affairs have, and I'm gonna let Elizabeth field this in a moment, have hundreds and hundreds of uh, students who work for them. And it might be that not all of those during these hectic times were able to be communicated with in the way that we'd like because people were scrambling to try to keep the wheels on for the university's sake. Uh, I will tell you that we don't love having to cut student employment, but when there's no jobs for students to do and we can't find a suitable replacement job, it has been necessary in some cases. I hope that over the weeks to come that we'll be able to find ways to help them uh, and to help them continue their job search process through our Career Center and other resources. Elizabeth, you want to address that because you and Jennifer probably have the most student employees. Sure, I'll be happy to. Um, I know that it's been very difficult for us as we've not had our students to be able to support us in some of our areas across campus. You mentioned the Career Center. They are definitely available to support our students in the student employment area. So if they don't have a, a position and are looking for a position, we do post those part-time positions on 
um, their website um, on Handshake, the Career Center's website. So students can definitely go to that location and look for them. Um, there are career advisors and coaches that are available to help them find even part-time positions, not just full-time positions. So I would encourage everybody to use that Career Center website. And as we know, we work our way into the summer and prepare for fall. We are hoping that we will be hiring a great number of students back on our campus. Um, we miss them. We need them in our areas. We're grateful for the ones that have been able to work remotely, but know that that's been limited. And I'll just add that while we have talked about a hiring freeze that applies it to staff and faculty, it does not apply to student workers. So as we're able to begin to ramp back up some of our operations, we will actively be hiring students. And so you can expect more student postings, particularly for summer two and for fall semester. All right, thank you everybody for that response. Um, we have been reading a lot of kudos, as we mentioned earlier, just a few others that came in. Uh, first of all, a lot of kudos to staff and faculty, and we're gonna go back to the president in just a moment for a wrap up, but a lot of staff and faculty comments and too many to really mention, even though I'd love to read all of them. Uh, there's a couple at the Student Rec Center. Somebody noted that they're keeping us moving through online programs, and uh, that's great when we're all uh, stuck in various locations. And also the Emergency Operations Center for their work that's been going on since this started. Uh, financial aid office, there are just many shout outs that have been coming in. So let's wrap up the town hall by going back to President Smotris for some closing remarks about, uh, again, where we've been and where we're going. I'm not sure if we lost the president with uh, connection. Yes, you lost me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Zoom etiquette. I only have to remember to unmute myself. Hey, how many of you wish you could mute me at will? I, don't answer that. Uh, so what I want to say is I'm overwhelmed by the many positive comments that we've had. Uh, I, I really appreciate them, and I think they're in recognition of the people who've really kept this university moving forward. and. They've done such a great job. So first, gratitude is in, in order here. Uh, the leadership team's done a great job as well. What I wanna tell you is that we actually really care about what you say. So thanks to all of you who've taken the time out of your day to join us and offer comments. We're going to be looking at all of the comments, negative, positive, and what we can do better um, so that we can manage to meet your needs and manage to do the best job we know how to make sure our students, faculty, and staff are thriving and moving forward in a very challenging environment. So you're helping us by informing us. It doesn't have to stop here. Uh, I want you to feel free to send forward. And Jim, I don't know if we have a URL for that, but we can continue to take your comments. We'll continue to try to address them. They will continue to inform us about what we can do to create a stronger, more resilient community that moves into fall with the most, with the highest probability for success. So I want to thank my fellow panelists, Jennifer and Elizabeth. Uh, you have done an amazing job, and I don't name every cabinet member, but I just want to say uh, all of you have contributed in major ways to the successes that I've been reading about. So with that, thank you. I appreciate all of you, and I hope that you stay safe and continue to make progress. I hope that you feel supported and where you haven't, you'll let us know. And I'm just gonna end with go mean green. And President Smotras, just to uh, share that uh, address, UNT president at unt.edu, if people wanna give additional comments. Thank you everybody for being here and thanks for joining us online. Well, you heard a little bit about how the CARES Act will be distributed in the future, as well as how UNT plans on retaining the students currently enrolled. If you weren't able to tune into the virtual town hall, make sure you go to NTTV's Twitter. You can find that at NTTV underscore news. We highlighted all of the most important information of the town hall, and we'll continue to bring you information throughout the summer.
Everyone be safe. Thank you.